I'm Ollie Barrett, and over the next few weeks, I'm going to be traveling to meet the chief execs of some of the UK's most successful listed companies. I'm going to find out what drives them, about the challenges they've faced, and what they've learned. And most of all, about the impact that they want to have on the world around them. Welcome to the Ambition Nation Listed 50. Andy Thorburn, Chief Executive of Emis, great to meet you. Good morning, how are you? Yeah, extremely well. I'm delighted we get to connect. Uh, I'm in England, you're in Scotland. Uh, but why don't we get started, Andy, by telling us a bit about what Emis does, because you do so many good things, but just help us to get our heads into it. Sure, no problem. So Emis is the leader in connected healthcare in the UK. So what it does and what we do is connect uh, software and systems to put the patient at the centre of treatment. And our, our systems predominantly are for, for clinicians to be able to treat you and me in an hour of need. So um, that's what we do. Uh, the company's been around for 32 years now, and uh, we've been public since 2010. So uh, that's a bit about EMIS. Got it. So, so, so let's just zoom in so we understand what that looks like in practice. I'm now going into a pharmacy, into a doctor's surgery, a hospital. H help us bring it to life, just so we're crystal clear. The first thing is we've deployed about 10,000 clinical systems across the UK, so we're a big player. So when you go in and see your GP and he or she is typing into the, the, the PC in front of them, 57% uh, of the time, that's our software. So we are recording all of the, the conversation that the, the, the GP wishes to record and capturing all the information about you and me as patients. So that's an incredibly important system for us called EMIS Web. Yeah. Um, on the high street, and a fun fact in the high street is we dispensed about 650 million prescriptions last year wow. um, through our dispensing software on the high street. Um, and we're in 5,200 locations across the UK just on that. Yeah. We also provide software for clinicians on the go in the community. So we do a lot of work with hospices for end of life management, for example, for nurses, that type of thing. And we're also in a &E. so we, we run a workflow system last year that processed 14 million patients to make sure they're in the right place when they're in the emergency room or a &E in the, the old term. And then we also um, are heavily involved in data and analytics and also a digital app called Patient Access. Either during your own tenure or even before, would you put your finger on a particular moment in the growth journey that you thought was particularly defining? Yeah, look, I, I think the, the big thing for a company like Emis is to go on formal NHS frameworks. And the big framework that we have, which is incredibly important to us, and um, the company first went on those in the mid-2000s, is the, the GP framework for England. And I think that was the defining moment for Emis to come onto that framework and then to build up the business from there. So that was the defining moment. And, and each time we renew is also very important to us, of course. Yeah. Um, but that would be the defining moment, I think, in the history of the company. Your share price performs incredibly well. You're doing well as a company. How do you manage to do that? Um, I think it's about being really focused on what we're good at. And clinical software, clinical intelligence is the key. And you see a lot of the bigger players of your generic data solutions, for example. Well, we're focused on the clinical aspect of data, making sure that we understand that on behalf of our customers, making sure we look after that and provide them with the right tools. And just say, data. forgive me, Andy, just, just say what you mean by that, the clinical aspect of data. What do you mean by that? It's about that clinical content and having people that can understand it and also that we can understand the clinicians using that data on a day-to-day -day basis. In the future, uh, and you might tell me it's already happening, uh, will I get to access my patient records myself? Because at the moment, the doctor's, you know, tapping away. And I'm wondering, I wonder what all that says. Yeah, actually, the the opportunity to have your patient record held in your digital record is there today. We actually do it through our mobile app called Patient Access, and there's 13 million people have downloaded that app. So you can approach your GP and they, they can then approve that you hold a summary of your patient record. And you can also then use that or donate that for say clinical research, yeah. if you deem that's possible. So it's heading that direction. Yeah, that's fascinating because actually, if you look at a parallel industry like fintech financial services we've seen open banking i wonder to what extent we'll see the dawn of open health or does that open actually a can of worms yeah it, you know the, the whole control of data and protecting the patient is incredibly important and you've got to do that under real clear guidelines and uh, 
and rules for sure. But I think there's a recognition because of the pandemic that population health is really important. And we had 50,000 people that were prepared to tell us about their experience of having COVID. Ah. And they volunteered that. So people want to help. And all of us understand the impact of something like this pandemic. Yeah. And they're prepared to release their own personal experience. And that, that was incredibly powerful. Yeah, it's a really powerful exchange, isn't it? Um, so I want to talk to you about um, what, you've, what you've been through. But very briefly, um, you're running not just any company, but a listed company. Yeah. What, what do you think are some of the benefits of that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's been really good. This is my second experience in a senior position, a public company. Um, the first thing I would say is our shareholders, our major shareholders are incredibly loyal to EMIS. And they've been with uh, the company for a long, long time. And I find that my interactions with them are very good um, from the point of view. They're really interested in what we're trying to do. Yeah. Um, secondly, if and when we need to raise money, I think we'll have the support there because we continue to deliver our promises. Yeah. And we're definitely moving to the next stage of growth for the business. And uh, I think that's a big opportunity for us. So uh, I, overall, I see it's very positive. It does come with a little bit of overhead, of course, in managing all of the regulations there, but that's absolutely fine. So, so tell tell us a little bit about what happened in the business, particularly when the pandemic hit. Because, I mean, to, to say you flew into action would be a bit of an understatement. Tell us, in a nutshell, what happened and what you learned along that journey. Yeah, it's quite interesting. The uh, Sean, who is our chief medical officer, Doctor Sean, I should say officially, of course. Um, he, he was alert to what was happening in China very early, even before it was hitting the press. And he came and advised us as an exec team that, uh, look, if this, if this develops into a pandemic, we've got to be ready. And what we did before anyone asked us is started working on updating our systems to deal with what was coming. Mm. And that was incredibly important. So as our customers started to come towards us, we, we were ready. What did it mean in practice? Because you already well, had it means, it means to practice reconfiguration of the systems to be able to deal with the sort of content that's required around, you know, if you look at the, the testing, for example, we're heavily involved in the testing process behind the scenes. And obviously, we are, we are involved in the whole immunization program for England. We're the only provider of the, the software and system that records all those vaccinations. And I've got a dashboard that I see every hour that can tell you how many vaccinations happened in England. So... Yeah. That, that um, preparation was incredibly important. The next thing was the commitment of our team. And I've, I've been in business a long time and I can never ever say before that I wouldn't change a single thing last year, apart from obviously we don't want to have a pandemic, but our company's reaction and our people's reaction was incredible. Yeah. At one point, we had 130 parallel projects for the NHS for COVID. Yeah, and our right. team did an incredible job dealing with those. But, but speaking of parallel, Andy, in a, in a parallel universe, you would have said, well, we could do this. We could go into action in this way, but we're going to have to have it signed and sealed and costed and everything else. I'm getting the sense from listening to you this morning that there was a huge amount of discretionary effort that went in in anticipation of all that. So, so help me understand that. Yeah, completely. We actually sat down as a management team early in quarter one and said, how are we going to deal with this? Because it's coming. And we said, we're not going to go for short-term profit. And we are a for-profit company, obviously. We're going to do the right thing by colleagues and customers every single day through this. Um, our customers have been incredibly loyal to us. And it was our time to be loyal to them. And that's what we decided to do. So we made the decisions for the benefit of our customers, our users, and our staff at all times. And that was the center of our decision-making. Yeah. And it's not always about making money. It's about doing the right thing. And it helps build our brand for the long term as well. And, and I'm, I'm really pleased with the decision we made yeah. that we didn't change it at all. Yeah, gosh, that's probably one of the most powerful things anyone said in this series. Thank you. Uh, thank you for what you did. Um, how now have you reflected on how it might um, affect, you know, the plans for the business? Because, you know, the new motto, I suppose, is expect the unexpected. Yeah. And it's interesting uh, three years ago, we set out to do a technology refresh for the group, and we had three things we decided to do. One was digital, the second was data and analytics, and the third was interoperability, you know, connecting everything mm -hmm. up. And I've got to say that those judgments now, we didn't know a pandemic was coming, actually fit perfectly for the world we're in, where there's going to be that digital connection. 
everyone needs insight and it's got to be joined up. Mm. And uh, I'm delighted we're in the right place at the right time to help our customers and the greater population. As you look out now, what are the biggest opportunities facing EMIS? Yeah, the, the big opportunity uh, is all around healthcare data we see. So we've got these amazing building blocks of care systems and all those settings you describe and others. And we're really important to the UK's healthcare system. Yeah. But what we think the pandemic has shown is understanding patient insights at the macro level, at the regional level, at the local level are very, very important. And we've built EMIS X Analytics, which is a new capability we brought in stream in the last year. And mm. we think that will really help healthcare professionals understand the challenges going forward. That's mm. a big opportunity for us. Within GDPR rules, no shortcuts, legal and ethical. And I say that every time to the team. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, we see it as a big opportunity, uh, providing we manage it in the right way. How about the biggest challenges? You're in the chief exec seat. Uh, what, what, what do you see ahead? Look, the, the challenges of like many businesses right now is trying to understand how predictable markets will be. That's, that's obviously really important for in every part of business. Markets and customer environments. And for us, obviously, the direct impact of the pandemic meant we had to really move and be agile. Um, so I think that continues to be a challenge. We've done a good job anticipating things, but you never know what's around the corner. And I think the other thing is that the, the world of employment's changed. You know, people working from home, I'm at home today, and expectations from uh, people either wanting to join EMIS or retaining people within the company, that's going to be a challenge because the world has changed, our views have changed, and we need to be adaptable as an employer to make sure that we, we adapt to that. What, what, what would your tip be to maintain culture even if you're not seeing someone face-to-face? Is there anything you've learned over this last year? That yeah, you've- um, uh, frequent and often communication is key. And one of the great things about whether you're using Teams or Zoom or any of the video platforms, it actually is a leveling capability. Yeah. And so one of the things that I hold regularly is a session called, called Ask Andy for all staff. Mm-hmm. There's no agenda apart from questions from the team. And also my colleagues all, also hold Ask Questions where are uh, sessions where questions can be asked on any topic as long as they're constructive. I've got just a, f- a, a few more questions that I want to ask you, but particularly around this relationship um, with your customers. So in some cases, you're making products for healthcare professionals. In some cases, um, you know, it's for the patients uh, themselves. So I'm just trying to understand how the product development, the decision making differs or not between those two, frankly, very different audiences, or you might say, well, they're more similar than you might think. Yeah, so the, the, there are considerations there. The first is that because you want to connect healthcare settings, the big picture is you've got to think how a consumer engagement fits into the overall picture. Mm. Um, and we have got people that just think about that overall interaction of connecting healthcare. The second is that clearly a user experience for a, an individual is different from a professional experience from a GP yeah. um, or someone working in a pharmacy setting. That's a very technical approach and therefore the way you design the systems around workflow and efficient use of the tool and speed is is a different concept but we've we've hired people in in both domains and they work very hard to to make sure that interface is 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 right and then behind the scenes we're connecting everything through our platform uh, emis x um, and that's working well so far an onlooker to your collaboration might say i struggle to see where bits of the nhs end and EMIS begins and vice versa. Now, to one person, that's that's called seamless. Yeah. To another, they might go, well, this is confusing. And I've got strong views about how the private sector and the public sector join forces. So, so just help us to understand how, do, how, we, how we get the best of that relationship, the future of that relationship, because clearly you're saving and supporting lives. The way we think about it is, is about collaboration. We think about our role is to give the professionals in the NHS the tools to be successful. Um, We think that by doing that, patient outcomes will be improved and therefore we're doing the right thing. Mm. But also we're doing it at profit. We are a public company and I'm absolutely fine with that as long as our pricing and charging is fair. We're very well regulated within public sector purchasing and frameworks. And an intimate relationship between a strategic supplier like us and our customers is essential for the healthcare system. What do you say to somebody who says, well, um, what if the NHS had its own coders and software 
developers and actually maybe try to draw that expertise back into the centre? Yeah, and they do have, there, there are teams of people within NHS that are focused on technology. And I think it's about the balance. Yeah. I understand why that's attractive, being closer to the, the their users within one organisation. But equally, there's a recognition that you need innovation from the private sector. And, and the thing we can do is we can be a little bit more agile because we're not part of such a big system. Yeah. And that benefits, and we've shown the benefit there through the pandemic that we can move really quickly and to be honest, we can make decisions really fast and decide what's the appropriate approach. So it is a balance. At the core of this, it's people's health. And, you know, supporting that is so many interesting digital technologies. So if you sort of sit back for a moment and sort of survey what's possible, what sort of developments get you excited? There's lots of people involved in AI and, and new ways of looking at data. And one of the things we've designed is, is our platform is capable of using third party capabilities. We don't think it should be exclusive to us. Yeah. Um, and that technology deployed at scale with the sort of information we hold on behalf of our customers, again, with the right approvals, mm. we think opens up a really amazing opportunity to understand healthcare trends and issues and people at risk um, mm. much earlier and at scale and allows uh, the company to the, the country to be proactive in managing those health challenges. So yeah, I think I, that, that's the type of thing that's coming. Is there something that comes to your mind that you've seen or you know is being developed that, that you think can give us a really helpful contrast in what AI brings to the party? We're working with a life sciences company right now who are running an algorithm across a, a very large data set to identify people at risk. And then yeah. those people at risk are being fed directly into the GP workflow in the practice. So this is about using a very innovative, innovative tool that's been signed yeah. off by the regulatory authority so it's accurate, doing it across our scale data environment, EMSX analytics, yeah. but then feeding into our uh, GP desktops that the GP can then say that Andy or Ollie are at risk of this condition and we can be contacted, brought in, assessed, and then the appropriate yeah. treatment path. Yeah. So and we're seeing those things happening for real. Give me your view on how big data will play a role in the future of healthcare. And big data is overused, isn't it? But, uh, you know, data in general, you're handling a huge amount of, of to, to distill it, customer information. Huge. I think it'd be absolutely huge. And I think as people understand more about what's, what's within those data sets, you know, when you look at from birth to death and the data that's been captured, we just look at our EMIS web system, it is incredibly powerful. And the more people get a chance to understand that, the better the population health will be. Yeah. And then it will be uh, this tremendous cycle that people understand within a responsible approach you can really understand what's going on and help people be proactive in, in caring for them. Because presumably, Andy, if we're serious about getting into the business of prevention, then the data can provide us the clues for the intervention. Completely. And, and I just know we, we, you know, I look at some of the projects we've been doing at a national and local scale and the output's incredible. And the really smart people, we were working with partners in Oxford University, for example, um, these are the best of the best and the insights they're getting are not just around COVID, but the impact of that and other conditions, um, incredibly powerful. So I, I think this will build and build and build. The key thing is that we don't take shortcuts. There's got to be rules. There's got to be controls. And that's absolutely fine. But the more we get into it, the better it will be, in my view. Just noting one of your products, EMS, uh, EMIS X Analytics. And yeah. There, I, 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 I realise you're in the business there of cloud-based analytics, but I want to be even clearer on why that matters and its power and potential. It matters, first of all, is we're providing new tools to uh, NHS colleagues to look at their own data in a very sophisticated way. We've organised it for them all already. So often when you buy a data system, it takes a long time to populate it, to cleanse the data, to make sure the data's appropriate. We've done all that work. We, we did that over the last three years. And therefore, it's already enabled with special tools to look at healthcare data. And, and it goes back to identifying patients at risk. 
understanding population trends and figuring out the right policies to be able to deal with them. How about um, you know the, the topic at the at the top of all of our minds, particularly this year, is around sustainability, around the impact that we have on the planet. Just just help me to understand what that looks like in a world of what I would think of you in being in health tech, really. And what, if any sense, Andy, do you have that those concerns are moving up your agenda? And if they are moving up it, why? They're, they're absolutely uh, uh, central to what we do and actually how we think as an organisation. Mm. Um, and, and because what we do for a living is completely relevant to that agenda. And there's two things. It's our desire, number one, but also our shareholders are interested. You know, the world of investing is moving to focus on ESG, and that's absolutely right and proper. And we've got to be able to explain how we do and what we do and also take targets to achieve, you know, improvements over time. See, see, that's very interesting. So um, to what extent do you notice the conversations you're having with investors are in any way different to the ones you're having with them, probably the same ones, two years ago, for example? Yeah, I, I would say in in last six to 12 months, we've definitely seen much more interest and, and um, discussions about what are the big initiatives for us. And one of the, the key things we are, are absolutely strong in is in the social side because of what we do. Yeah. And our investors are very interested and also prospective investors are really interested in that side of the business. Mm. So is there ever, the $100 million question, is there ever a sense of trade-off between profitability, to use one metric, and impact. And go back to our decision around what we did in the pandemic. Our judgment as an exec team, supported by the board, was the social impact of EMIS through the pandemic is enormous mm. and was enormous and will continue to be at this stage. And therefore, we decided to do the absolute right thing. And we could have taken some more short-term profits. We decided not to, and that was deliberate. Because we realized if we did a great job, the nations, all the four home nations who we support would be in a better situation. And therefore, that's a specific example, no trade-off. Um, and we're very conscious of what we do for a living, where we sit in society, as well as our responsibility to our shareholders. And, and my judgment, the CEO, is doing the right thing, helps build the brand for long-term growth for this company. And it just was the right thing to do. And our staff loved their decision making as their customers. And, and we were proud of that. Well, huge good luck and every success to you as you do that. You support hundreds of thousands of people for whom caring is their day job. And it's uh, very refreshing to hear that it is also yours. So um, thank you, Andy Thorburn, so much for joining me. My absolute pleasure. Thank you.